Okay, welcome to the November 3rd, 2021 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to welcome all of the folks out there who are interested in commenting on one or more of the nine proposals that we have before us this evening. Uh, tonight, we have really one main agenda item, and that is to listen to all of you who are out here wishing to make your voices heard on, again, one or more of these nine proposals that are out there. Uh, the process is that we are here to listen to you, not to comment. Uh, we are a recommending body, the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, we make recommendations. We move them along to city council and city council is the one that decides whether or not to fund these proposals. But generally speaking, given the amount of work that could work, I hope that we do, they are uh, um, off, most, more often, almost, off, almost always uh, go along with what our recommendations are. Again, tonight we have the public comment portion of our process. We have already heard from the applicants. We've had a chance to ask them questions. We have had a chance to look at their, at their, at their proposals. Uh, on November the 17th, that's two weeks from this evening, we welcome you to join us again. And in that meeting is where we will be making our deliberations in terms of which uh, of the nine proposals to fund. For this cycle, those nine proposals are asking for 1.2, a little over $1.2 million in requests. Uh, so as trustees of the public tax domain, we take our volunteer jobs very seriously and uh, do our due diligence, hopefully in our deliberations. But we welcome you to join us in that November 17th meeting as we welcome you to join us in any of our meetings. The process today was we have just a, a tiny bit of business to attend to. And then we're going to go in the order of the agenda that uh, Sarah our wonderful staff person for the Community Preservation Committee has, has, uh, has put forward. We'll start with the Grow Food Northampton project, move on to the Michelson Gallery's facade repair, go on to three of the city proposals, the open space acquisitions, Connecticut River Greenway, and the accessible Rocky Hill Trails proposal, move on to the mortgage subsidy program, on to Shepherd Barn, outdoor pickleball and then housing the disabled homeless. We put, or Sarah put what she thought was the projects with the most uh, interest perhaps in public comments at the end. So those of you that are just wanting to speak to some of these others won't have to, have to stick around. We certainly encourage you to stay through the whole meeting and listen to what your neighbors, friends and neighbors have to say, uh, but we recognize that people have other places uh, to be. Um, I think most people here by this time in the, uh, the, you know, the decades of the pandemic, how long has it been, uh, are somewhat familiar with Zoom stuff. So what we'll ask is that when you're interested or, or wanting to speak, that you do a little raise your hand button on the bottom of the uh, screen there, and Sarah will be the one that will, that will call on you. Again, we're going to go by proposal. Uh, I'm making an assumption or we're making an assumption that some of you will want to speak to more than one proposal and you are certainly more, more than welcome to do that. Uh, so once again, thank you for your participation. Hopefully you participated yesterday in a civic event, which was voting for uh, mayor and city council and some of the other folks out there and then participating again in our town process by commenting on the on the proposals that we have in front of us. We have just a couple of quick items to get to before we begin public comments. Um, we always open up every one of our meetings with general public comment. So if anyone has anything they'd like to say that do not specifically apply to these proposals, but are just general community preservation committee comments, now is the time to do so. Any hands on that? Uh, yeah, uh, Pamela Schwartz, Brian. Sure, Pam. 
Uh, so, Chair, I, I, I know we exchanged earlier, and um, I'm wondering in view of um, another meeting I'm leading at 730, whether I could speak very briefly on one of the projects on this list. Is that okay? I just want yeah, to Sure. So, uh, Pam, Pamela did get in touch with us and pled her case eloquently, so <laughs> we'll... Uh, Thank you. Um, switch around our agenda a little bit to allow for that. Pamela? I, I really appreciate it. So um, thank you. I'm here. My name is Pamela Schwartz. I um, live at 22 Columbus in Northampton, um, have lived in Northampton for almost 30 years. And I'm also director of the Western Massachusetts Network to End Homelessness. And for my couple of minutes here, I want to speak. I am very much bringing my uh, commitment to this project, the Independent Housing Solutions Project that you'll hear more about later on as a resident. It's almost impossible for me to separate out my, my profession and my personal in this one, but I will bring um, in particular my perspective as director of the Western Mass Network and Homelessness to you all. Um, this, the project that you're going to hear more on that I know you've already learned a lot about just for the sake of everyone on the screen is around um, developing 16 units for medically compromised, chronically homeless individuals who have experienced, well, who've experienced homelessness, that's implicit in the chronically homeless, homeless individuals. This is a project that's on Franklin Street in Northampton. And I'm, I'm here to speak in my very fervent support of this project as an extraordinary opportunity for our city to provide find the financial support that it takes to provide this critical housing um, that is in such extraordinarily short supply. And it is nothing less than a life and death matter providing these housing units um, for, with, surrounded with support services for um, these long time compromised, most vulnerable individuals living rough, living on the streets, living in places not fit for human habitation. And I wanna share from a network perspective that what is being proposed in this, in this housing development is truly a best practice um, that is evidenced across the country, across the state and in our region. And it's so exciting that we have a chance to support this here in Northampton. It is the model of, that will provide stable housing for our most compromised individuals surrounded with necessary support services in a way that not only saves lives and gives them the dignity they deserve, but also saves our, our emergency services output, the cost of healthcare will go down, the use of emergency services go down, and our, whole, our sense of pride and, um, and commitment to our community goes up because we are taking care of our most vulnerable people in a way that is safe and dignified and uh, safe for everyone involved, including the neighbors. I, I wanna say I had the privilege to be part of a community meeting a week ago. I see some of the faces here who were at that meeting who spoke in favor of this project. You'll probably hear from them later, um, but it was a very moving experience um, to be on the screen with 30 people from the neighborhood who were said, we are, proud and uh, to, to do this, to have this in our city, to have this in our neighborhood. And we trust based on the information that they received and the information I'm here to attest to that this project is sound in its wraparound services, in, it, in the model that it offers to ensure safety for the individuals, safety for our community and improvement of quality of life for everybody. So I just wanted to lend you meet you on behalf of the entire network, which represents four counties um, and hundreds of providers working to prevent and end homelessness, uh, my support for this project and hope that you fund it to the maximum amount possible. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Pamela. Before we get on to additional comments, we have one very quick item to attend to, and that's the approval of minutes from our March 17th 2021 uh, meeting. Um, so committee members will be asked to vote on that. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Mm, so moved. Chris, thank you. A second? Second. Thank you, Julia. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, committee members, let's, Sarah, need to take us through a roll call? No, uh, we do. Um, Brian? Uh, yes. Martha? Yes. Linda? Yes. Chris? Yes. Dan? Yes. Jana? Can I confirm, can I vote even though I wasn't in attendance at the meeting? 
Uh, you can abstain if you wish, or you, or you can vote. Okay, I will abstain. Thank you. All right. Uh, Jen? Abstain for the same reason. Jeff? Yes. And Julia? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is no chair's report tonight, so we'll move right on into the uh, into folks commenting on the projects. Um, so again, uh, make sure when you comment, uh, I think most people are Zoom uh, friendly now, um, unmute yourself, and then going back to muting is always a, a, a nice thing to do. We're gonna begin with the farmland reclamation rehabilitation project for Grow Food Northampton. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to that? Uh, Aaron? Hi, uh, yes, thanks. Uh, my name is Aaron Bazuvis. I'm a Northampton resident and I've been a member uh, of uh, Grow Food Northampton's Organic Community Garden since uh, the beginning in 2012. In fact, I like to boast that I have the oldest asparagus bed um, in the garden. <laughs> um, uh, from my standpoint as a gardener, uh, I just want to endorse the idea that our community garden is, is truly that, a community place. When I show up to uh, tend to my own plot or to do garden service or even participating in our listserv, I've had opportunities to collaborate with neighbors that I wouldn't have otherwise met. I've learned uh, and shared growing techniques, recipes, and inspiration uh, from my fellow gardeners. Um, many of us also take particular pride in stewarding land that has long been used for agriculture, including in the 1840s by the Northampton Association of Industry and Education, uh, an abolitionist community uh, that used what is now our garden uh, to grow sugar beets as a protest against the uh, cane sugar production um, in the West Indies relying on slave labor. We, we continue in this tradition, growing our veggies as a political and a social act in endorsement of such principles of sustainability, localism, environmental conservation, and promoting human and, and community health. Um, I endorse uh, Grow Food Northampton's request for a grant to um, support our common use areas, uh, the hedgerow in particular, which would get some uh, attention um, if we received the grant. Um, particularly benefits all gardeners, not just in practical ways by blocking wind, um, but also fosters our community uh, as uh, gardeners share in its upkeep and in its bounty. Um, this and the other common use areas in our garden um, all increase the garden's functionality, its unique character and provide uh, critical spaces to uh, interact with other gardeners and, and really put the community in community garden. Uh, thank you for, uh, for uh, hearing our proposal and for taking the time to hear my comment. Thank you, Erin. Other folks for Grow Food Project? Uh, hi, my name is Daphne Bryan. I'm a gardener, oh, sorry, I'm at uh, 194 Spring Street in Northampton. Um, I'm a gardener at the uh, garden for about four or five years now, um, and uh, I'm also a neighbor. I live about a five minute walk up the road. And uh, in addition to supporting the proposal and reinforcing everything that Erin so eloquently sp stated about the community aspects of the garden, the incredible uh, agricultural uses of it for individuals and for families, uh, I just wanted to comment what a treasure of a neighborhood space that this is for our family and for all the families around here. Um, so often uh, I have two small children, two children who are about five years old and eight years old. So many times the question is, you know, let's go down to the hedgerow and see if the June berries are in season. Let's go pick some raspberries. Let's explore in the garden and learn about what's happening with our neighbors our uh, neighbors in our plots, meeting new people and kids that are just around the garden, hanging out with their families. And it's so valuable to have that community connection that is not based around, you know, anything else really. Uh, and meeting all ages of folks and getting friendly with people across the community is really valuable. Um, and it's not only just uh, tending to our own plots, but it's expanding the community access, uh, as Aaron was saying, in the hedgerows, 
so many different layers of taking care of the hedgerows, harvesting from the hedgerows, uh, and interacting with fellow gardeners has just been incredibly valuable, uh, both for myself, my husband, and our children, uh, who are now picking up information about what's healthy, what's safe, how do I harvest a, a plant, how do I take care of the world around me, which I think is incredibly valuable, um, and that we wouldn't, I, really, I don't know where we would get that in sort of a pre-planned park or anything else like this. The community garden is really unique in having a neighborhood gathering spot that's educational uh, and valuable for everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daphne. Other folks for the Grow Food Project? Great, uh, Gwen. Um, yes, hello, my name is Gwen. Can you guys, yeah, see me. Um, and I live at Hampshire Heights in Northampton and I am a community gardener here at Northampton, um, Grow Food Northampton. And um, I wanted to come tonight to speak to support any kind of funding that might come for Grow Food Northampton because um, I, I, I feel that remediating along the East Field is important to aid in the maintenance and the land around Grow, Grow Food Northampton and maintaining, um, as others have mentioned, the history um, behind this. And um, also to deal with invasive species that are encroaching on the land uh, where some of these species are, are consuming parts of the fields and they can impact land availability for local food production. Um, and this, this means the historical purpose for the land can stay intact um, along the river where there is flooding as well. It would be good to give this area of the field attention for the sake of preserving it in accordance with its original purpose. Um, remediating along the back eastern side of the Grow Food Northampton Community Garden will enable more hedgerow to go in that provides habitat and edible berries and fruits to people and wildlife and will provide opportunity for more community interaction. Grow Food Northampton will be able to add more small community spaces or garden plots over time, which are available to the public in the surrounding neighborhood. It can enable Grow Food Northampton to support local market gardeners or community gardeners more effectively over time as well. Grow Food Northampton offers a variety of educational opportunities just by being a gardener there or by various little seminars that they offer throughout the year that have been very important as new gardeners came in during the pandemic. Um, and Grow Food Northampton supports community food, food growing for low-income gardeners. Um, they support small farmers by providing farmland and black farmers who contribute to the food supply chain locally and regionally. Uh, and having more money for this will ensure that our region can encourage a healthy biodiversity and racial diversity uh, within and beyond the community. So continuing to support issues around food sovereignty and food justice by awarding this grant to Grow Food Northampton for the preservation of this land would be a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. All right, and Elisa? Hi, good evening. Um, I just always start these meetings by thanking those of you on the CPC and any other uh, commission for your service because I know how much time and energy it takes, how much thinking it takes. And so just thank you to all of you CPC members just to start. Um, I'm Elisa Klein, I live in Leeds. Um, I'm the executive director of Grow Food Northampton and um, some of our community gardeners have already very articulately uh, shared with you the importance of the work that we do at Grow Food Northampton. I'd like to contextualize it a little bit. Oh, I'm very sorry, we have a landline that I cannot shut off. I can probably hear it ringing. Um, I wanted to contextualize a little bit what uh, Grow Food Northampton is in the community and what we do in the community, um, I think it's helpful to kind of situate the what we're asking for within that bigger picture. Um, you may know some of this, but I'll, I'll go through it a little bit. We're an organization that's working to create a just local food system. 
and that entails um, immediate responses to food insecurity. It's creating food access through our community food distribution project to 14 uh, low-income communities around the city. Um, it's supporting 27 different farms, purchasing from them. I think we've purchased at this point over 20 tons of food since the beginning of the pandemic to, um, to give to people uh, living in subsidized housing around the city. We also run the Tuesday market, as you probably know, and are expanding to cover uh, winter markets beginning this year. Um, we do long-term solutions, and that's about providing land access and education. And the land access piece is Grow Food Northampton Community Farm that we're asking for these funds for. On the farm, we have eight uh, farmers that lease from us small farmers and small farms and slightly larger farms, um, half of which are refugee immigrant and farmers of color. We're very proud of the work that we're doing to do some reparative work in providing land access to farmers who have kind of historically and traditionally been shut out of uh, access to land and the option, the, the ability to farm. Um, and the last thing that I did mention is uh, the education piece. We provide education in the Northampton Public Schools and we provide extensive education on the Grow Food Northampton Community Farm. Um, Aaron referred to the history of uh, the Grow Food Northampton Community Farm. The farm is on unseeded Pecumtuck and Nipmuc land. Um, it was farmed you know, centuries and centuries ago by Native Americans. Um, and during the 1800s, it was, uh, it was the farm of the Northampton Association of Education and, in, and Industry, the Florence-based abolitionist community. So we at Grow Food Northampton see ourselves as, as the stewards of this land, and we're trying very hard to be the strongest and best stewards that we can to make sure that the Grow Food Northampton community farm is a locus of um, production of food expanding knowledge about how to grow and produce local, healthy, organic food. And with this CPA grant, it will allow us to expand. Uh, we have 121 acres. We um, have about 100 of those in production. We're trying to create more space for both community gardens, edible hedgerow, um, which is open to community foraging. So anyone in the community is welcome to come pick fruits and nuts from the trees and the bushes, the bramble that we have, um, and also clear our east parcel so that we can, um, one, be good neighbors to the neighbors to the Northampton, the Grow Food Northampton Community Farm, but also um, provide more space for additional farmers to farm at Grow Food, uh, at the Grow Food Northampton Community Farm. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much for listening. And um, I will cede my time to whoever else would like to speak to our proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Anyone else for the Grow Food proposal? Sarah, are you seeing anyone out there? I am not. Hi, I, I'm not sure how to make the the, the fake hand go. I'd no, like to just, just the real wait. hand go. <laughs> Hi, um, I, I'm, my name is Ann Teschner and I um, live at 54 South Main Street in Florence and I am a gardener at the community gardens. Um, I also am a, a runner. I, I uh, am a rower. I um, help start the Amherst Cinema Center and I am the executive director of the Care Center in Holyoke. And I've spent a fair amount of time um, thinking about community and what builds community and how it all works. And um, I, I can confidently say, uh, and with just you know exhilaration say, I endorse the um, Grow Food Northampton request. In fact, I would suggest that they get more than the 20,000 they requested. Um, in my time as a gardener, which I've been there for three years as a gardener, I have had just visceral native um, experiences of community. I've 
spoken to people next to me who have cancer, who uh, uh, grow ghost peppers, who um, uh, harvest honey, who are marathon runners. There's a way in which, yeah, yeah, we're growing things and that's really important. Uh, and it is because, you know, I love what I eat out of my garden, but there's a, there's a community uh, linking that's going on there that's really profound. And I think it's important for Northampton to continue to support that. Um, so that's that piece. The space itself is spectacular and open to anyone who wants to walk through it all four seasons during, you know, wonderful star stuff. I went down there and we looked at Saturn, excuse me, Saturn in a telescope. I mean, it's a spectacular space. Um, and the idea of uh, expanding it to more lots and um, plots and uh, to expand the hedgerow, the hedgerow is just this beautiful and exquisite community um, sharing of space, food, berries, the whole, the whole of it is just um, a, a very um, hallowed, hallowed experience down there. So yeah, I, I would suggest that we, um, that you and uh, we all uh, support this in as big a way as we possibly can, that it is um, a profound, it's a small space in the, in the city and in a profound space in the city. And I really encourage you to support this request. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Any more hand waves or virtual hands up? Sarah, we're good, good to go? Uh, I think we're all set for the next project. Okay, so next up on the agenda is the facade repair for Michelson Galleries downtown. Someone like to speak to that? So, so we have some letters of support. Do you want me to read those or shall I submit them? I think perhaps uh, Paul submitting, given interest in time, submitting them would be wonderful. Okay. Uh, and you could maybe, uh, how many are there? There's have? three. There's three. So putting them out on our website for all of us to read and anyone else wants to read would might make sense for that if that's okay. Sounds good. Great, thank you, Paul. Other folks to speak to the Michelson proposal? Sarah, anyone out there? I uh, don't see any hands. Okay. And just an aside, and Paul has refreshed my memory. If folks out there feel more comfortable submitting written proposals, we, oh, I'm sorry, written uh, comments. We certainly entertain those up until our day of deliberation on the 17th. If you know other people after this who would like to submit in writing, um, please do so uh, through the, or uh, emailing Sarah is perhaps the best way uh, to, to, to do that. Uh, moving right on to the first of the three city proposals. The first is open space acquisitions uh, proposed by the planning and sustainability which are three separate parcels that the city is interested in acquiring. Anyone inter interested in speaking to that? Uh, Kestrel Land Trust. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. I'm Kristen DeBoer, I'm the executive director of Kestrel Land Trust and I'm just here to offer our ongoing support for the city's acquisitions of land uh, to support the open space and recreation plan in the city are involved with the Mineral Hills, the Salmo Hills and Parsons Greenway. They all support uh, local conservation goals as well as contribute to the larger need for forest conservation in the face of climate change and addressing biodiversity. So, I urge you to support it and we are there to hold the conservation restrictions as required and as needed um, per the city's guidelines. Thank you, Kristen. Other folks for open space acquisitions? Um, 
not seeing any. Good to go. Okay, moving right along to the Connecticut River Greenway Accessible Walkway, also submitted by the Office of Planning and Sustainability. Any speakers for that one? Um, Meg? Hi, thank you. Um, I'd just like to say that I really support this project. I am a kayaker. I do have limited mobility. And um, right now, the way the ramp is, it, it doesn't work. I never use it. Um, it's not accessible. And I um, would love to see changes made to this ramp. I've looked at the proposal um, and the different design options that the city's put together. And I think it would be um, a fantastic upgrade and make that space a lot, a lot more usable. Thanks. Thank you, Meg. All right, uh, Jamie, I apologize if I said your name wrong. Uh, hi, it's Jamie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, hi everyone, Jamie Albro Fisher. Um, appreciate the chance to speak with you tonight. Um, I am a board member of Northampton Community Rowing, uh, which is a, um, a nonprofit rowing organization. We operate out of the uh, site there off of Damon Road. Um, uh, in addition to being a board member, I'm actually a father too. Both of my daughters have been through uh, the youth program. Uh, NCR is, uh, has been there for about eight years um, and about uh, in the city here operating for over 20. Um, we run programs for youth, uh, masters, and really uh, anyone interested in uh, trying out rowing. Uh, our, our programs run year round. Uh, and, you know, one of the nice things that I really like about it is that especially the youth programs really provide um, interesting leadership opportunities. Uh, my own daughter, uh, Julia, who's on the team right now, is a captain of the varsity um, women's rowing team. And uh, it, it's just been a great opportunity for her to figure out you know, how do I lead my peers, uh, make a difference, give back, uh, and all of that. Um, we uh, made comments at the um, Connecticut River Greenway session uh, several weeks ago, um, uh, where they were taking comments about um, all the swimming areas across town, uh, and which ones um, to fund uh, based on the study that they did. Uh, we were very happy to be a part of that study. Um, as longtime users of this site. And um, uh, our, our primary concern and what we uh, presented to uh, them at the time was that um, we own and maintain uh, the docking system uh, that you see down there. And uh, this docking system we've had for quite a few years, it's in, uh, it's in a great state of disrepair and uh, it needs replacement. Um, and so we, we were asking the city basically if they would like to collaborate with us on that. And following that meeting, uh, Wayne Fiden contacted our executive director, Wendy Margus, um, about exactly that. Um, the, the docking system that we're considering uh, would do several things in addition to um, helping us, uh, you know, have something easier to maintain and launch our boats off of would also connect to the beach um, where there's been uh, obviously a lot of swimming and, uh, uh, and new visitors you know, with the beach that showed up um, a few years ago. We're happy, actually quite happy to share the site with the beach goers and other boaters and anyone really that wants to use the site because uh, we see it as a tremendous resource and greater use of the site uh, can only benefit us. Um, the beat, the, um, excuse me, the docking system that we're looking at uh, would provide not only a connection to the beach, but would provide accessible access um, to both the beach and to kayakers. So these docking systems now have these sort of chutes with rails where um, someone, you know, with any sort of, some sort of handicap um, or mobility issue uh, can actually put their small boat on a dock 
um, get into it with handles where it's stable. Um, and then they sort of release down the chute and uh, go into the water. Um, so we're talking with a couple of different vendors and are reviewing proposals, um, but that's certainly one piece of it that we would like to include. Um, that would also benefit an organization that we're uh, close with and work with uh, frequently, which is All Out Adventures. Um, so as you know, that group does a lot of um, handicapped and you know, accessible programs uh, of all kind on the river and elsewhere. Um, you know, the, the key thing for us, I mean, we are a nonprofit and as you all know, running a nonprofit is not easy. Our, our costs um, are covered by our revenue, uh, our operating costs are covered by revenue. We have basically a little left over. That's enough to maintain our equipment. Um, the boats are rather expensive and require um, ongoing repair uh, in addition to the docks. And so for us to, um, to, for us to get a new docking system, uh, they're quite expensive as you can see in Wayne's proposal, um, we would have to begin a capital campaign um, we would likely not get that done uh, before next season. Uh, and so are looking for any help. Uh, in exchange, as, as Wayne explained, you know, um, the city is great at capital pro um, pro projects, but not always uh, able to execute uh, on the operation side. And so we are happy to partner with the city in that way and uh, you know, put the docks out in the spring, take them, uh, take them back out in the fall and uh, maintain them through bad weather and uh, anything else that happens. Um, generally, I think that the site there is a tremendous resource for the community. Um, we've been very happy there uh, and that's all been made possible by the city really. Um, and uh, I think that the city should really look at the site uh, and should it even really broaden its vision for the site. There's plenty of space down there and other things that could be done we are actually considering a, a capital campaign to build a proper boathouse. Um, you guys have probably seen the sort of canvas covered erector set thing that we have down there. It, it does suit our needs, but uh, such a building does not last uh, that long. I think it has a 25 year life and it's already been there for eight years. So um, again, I think that investment in the site is good for not just us, for, but for the broader community. And we really appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, Amy? Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Amy Rhodes, and thank you so much for, um, for hosting this evening. Um, this is my cat's tail who's decided to join as well at this moment. Um, I live on 36 Monroe Street in Northampton. Um, I am also on the board at Northampton Community Rowing, um, and I'm also a geologist and a geology professor at uh, Smith College um, with some expertise uh, in wetlands. And um, I just wanted to echo uh, my support for um, you know, the very nice outline that Jamie um, provided about uh, the history of NCR and uh, its partnerships with uh, All Out Adventures and with the city. Um, and then also how um, our interaction with um, the broader community has actually expanded over these last two years. Um, I think in part because of, the, of um, some geologic changes to the river as well as to the pandemic. So Jamie mentioned the beach and uh, a, a new beach did form um, near this access point to the Connecticut River um, due to some interesting geology. Um, and it happened during the pandemic when people are uh, spending time close to home and looking for uh, increased outdoor recreational opportunities and in particular access to water, which is very hard to find um, free and accessible places to go swimming um, and to uh, launch a boat or a kayak um, um, during the summer. And so um, the formation, the natural formation of this beach, um, I think word got out quite quickly. And so our site ended up 
um, experiencing a lot of public traffic and interest, um, which is great, but um, there isn't an easy land access way to get to this beach, um, but people kind of made their own way to it um, by walking through a wetland area. Um, they made a path. Um, it's a beautiful path. Um, there, were, there were no permits or whatsoever to do it. It was just um, people demand wanting to get to this beach and to have access. Um, and so um, in part, building these docks is going to um, improve the access to this, what's become a very popular uh, swimming hole in a way that will be more accessible to more people. And that will also uh, no longer require need to go through the going to go through the wetland area in order to access the beach. So it's actually going to help um, uh, keep the, 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 um, the riverbank area um, in better condition and keep it from degrading because of um, the sort of the organic way that uh, people have been um, accessing this, this beach. Um, I just also want to say that, um, you know, we have had um, uh, that we really uh, also value part, part of the NCR mission is to um, help facilitate human powered boat craft. And so um, there's certainly a lot of rowers that are involved with NCR, but um, we have a commitment to um, making sure that those that want to access with kayaks or canoes, um, dragon boat, um, dragon boaters have also uh, used our facility as well. Um, uh, and so we have a commitment to um, enabling all kinds of public access, whether it be through kind of our, our partners that have sort of formal organizations that get people out to the river or just people from the general public. Um, I, I love the fact that um, there are several proposals um, before you today that are focusing on uh, improving opportunities for recreation for people in our community. And I think we're unique in that um, this is one that is um, promoting recreation and development of health um, in and around the water and um, you know, safe and increasing accessibility um, to safe access to water point, uh, to, to, to water and water kinds of recreation, I think is a unique aspect um, to this particular proposal. So thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Sally? Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Sally Lenowski, and I am the vice president of the board for Northampton Community Rowing um, and the, I guess, self appointed equipment and facilities coordinator um, of our small little nonprofit. Um, I've rowed in the valley since uh, the year of 2000, um, where I started at uh, the UMass site right at the Coolidge Bridge in Northampton and then uh, joined Northampton Community Rowing up at the Oxbow Marina location in East Hampton and then was delighted um, when with partnership through the city of Northampton in 2015, our club was able to move to um, what has become a really vibrant and exciting opportunity um, for riverfront access um, for the community. Um, so I was there when we helped do the fundraising to build our temporary boathouse for the site and have seen lots of changes over, over the time um, there. One of the things that's important, um, I think, in sort of my understanding is, is I'm a Cape Cod native. I grew up with sand between my toes and I understand the ocean and tides and currents and I understand lakes and ponds. I didn't really understand rivers. I now understand rivers uh, much, much better in terms of things. So here's a couple of things I've learned in the 20 years um, in, in my time on the Connecticut River that are relevant to this project and probably not as eloquent as, as uh, Amy has been. But things I've, three things I've seen is one is the river is alive. It's enjoyed dawn to dark um, in the spring and the fall with boaters, fisher people, bird watchers, nature lovers, and swimmers. Um, there is a lot of life in the river, on the river, and around the river, and this is really exciting. The river changes, as evidenced by the, over, um, the overnight de development of the new beach there, and um, in what was once a cove, 
And with floods, droughts, and the changing climate, the river is going to continue to change. And the last thing I've seen is if you increase access, boy, will people come and will they enjoy it? And then will they show you the ways in which they enjoy it and the challenges that they have in seeking that enjoyment? So I'm really delighted to be here tonight and to, um, and to be a part of a conversation that can support more people coming to the location as well as the ones who do, the ones who want to swim, to kayak, to row, to picnic, to relax, to do whatever it is in that location um, that we can partner with the city to make this more accessible for everyone. Um, it really is a tremendous community resource. The docks that we have, as Jamie mentioned, are at end of life. Um, they and the beach is not accessible really in the way that it is. So partnering with the city to do both is nothing but a win-win, I think. Um, we wouldn't be here without the support of the city and we are staying and we are committed to do our part to increase access um, in a safe and accessible improvement to the site. The other thing I might add is if we go downstream um, and we look at Holyoke, Holyoke Rose and their waterfront park, and we look at Springfield and their waterfront park. Northampton is ready to go there, and we can be as accessible and inclusive as those communities in getting people out and near the water. And so I'm really excited for this opportunity, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Sally. Anyone else for the Connecticut Greenway project? Sarah, are we good to go on this? I think so, not seeing anyone. Okay. All right, moving right along, continuing on the theme of accessibility, the Rocky Hill Trails uh, project also brought to us by Planning and Sustainability. Uh, Meg, again. Hello again. Um, so I just wanted to speak in support of this proposal for a unpaved, universally accessible trail space um, in the Rocky Hill Conservation uh, land. Um, right now, there are no unpaved, universally accessible trails on any of Northampton's conservation land. The only accessible trail is a paved and boardwalk trail that's about um, a tenth of a mile from the parking lot at Fitzgerald Lake to the edge of the lake. And um, it's a real gap in Northampton's nature space and, and accessibility because, um, you know, we have parks and we have bike trails. I live across the street from a bike trail, but it has a very different feeling. As much as I love it, it is a very different feeling from conservation land and being in a truly natural space. And if I want to go to a natural space that feels peaceful and, um, just restorative, I have to leave Northampton to do it. Um, and being, we know that being outside has health benefits. It's been something that's come up a lot during the pandemic. Um, we know that those health benefits exist, but what we've also come to learn is that not all green space is created equal. When a space is less built, when it feels more natural, you feel, um, more stress relief when you spend time in it. And I think that's really significant because people with limited mobility have significantly higher instances of stress-related illnesses than the portion of the population that doesn't have limited mobility. There are also gaps in the quality of life, almost every single measure of quality of life and standard of living between the disabled population and the non-disabled population. And we know that spending time in nature helps those, all of those things, our health and well-being. And I think um, it's just Northampton has beautiful, beautiful natural spaces. And we work a lot in this city to create conservation land. The city has a goal of like 24 or 25 percent um, of the land being conservation land. That's public land that I think should be accessible to the portion of the population that needs the health benefits that it provides probably more than 
than almost any other segment of the population. Um, but this trail, this universally accessible trail doesn't just help people who have disabilities. Um, it helps the senior population and people who have young children who might wanna take them out in strollers or carriers, that wider stable surface helps them um, bring their children out and introduce them to nature when they're as young as possible. These are multi-generational all ability spaces. And if you group all, all of those segments of the population in Northampton together, people who have disabling conditions, people who are over age 65 and people who are under age five, that's 30 to 46% of Northampton's population. So we're not talking about a fringe group of people. We're talking about a significant portion of Northampton's population that can benefit from a trail like the one that's being proposed. Um, and I really hope that you fully fund the project because it's really something that encompasses environmental justice and equity for a marginalized, historically marginalized population but it also has a public health component for all of those 30 to 46 percent of Northampton's population that could benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you, May. Karen? Hi there. I'm Karen Foster. I am the Ward 2 City Councilor. Um, I'm going to begin with my legal disclaimers real quick. Um, in addition to being the Ward 2 City Councilor, I'm also the Executive Director of All Out Adventures, which was mentioned previously. Um, I do have a conflict of interest with the previous proposal, which is why I did not speak to it. Um, the proposal for a universally accessible hiking trail is one that there may be the appearance of one, but not an actual conflict of interest as All Out Adventures would not be running hiking programs um, on, a, on a trip. Um, I do wanna to speak to the importance of that. Um, Meg and I have been talking um, and I swear we didn't coordinate, but she basically um, said my outline, um, which, which is great. And I think really speaks to the need. Um, you know, one of my favorite phrases I've ever read um, is about the healing power of recreation. And uh, for context, we've all just been through a pretty stressful. Um, I'm a parent. Good fortune of living quite close to the trails along the Mill River, and I walk those trails at least once a day, sometimes twice. And um, on my days where I'm definitely experiencing stress, having a hard time being out, being along the river, being out in the woods um, is my stress relief. And as Meg mentioned, um, many people who have disabilities um, experience higher levels um, of depression, of anxiety, of social isolation. And it's been shown time and again through research that being outdoors and time spent um, outdoors um, can really help to address that. Um, Northampton does an amazing job, I think, with accessibility. The bike path network um, is incredible, um, and there's definitely a focus moving forward. I think, um, you know, a place we, um, a universally accessible trail, um, you know, in the woods um, so that people of all ages and all abilities can get out and be with nature and experience that. And to Meg's point, um, my children were quite young when the Accessible Trail in Hadley at Fort River Recreation Area opened. And that was a place that I could bring one child in a stroller and a toddler, and they weren't tripping over roots and over rocks, um, but they could run the length of that trail. Um, as they've gotten a little bit older, there's a universally accessible trail at the DAR State Forest in Goshen that I take them to. And uh, when, when they were a little bit younger, I could get away with calling it mountain biking. And that was the trail that they would learn to ride their bikes on. It was an unpaved trail and it was an adventurous experience for them. Um, and so it is a trail that would meet um, a, quite a wide demographic need um, of people who are using manual wheelchairs, power wheelchairs, crutches, walkers, um, as well as, as Meg mentioned, um, people who are, are using strollers, as well as people maybe with a balance impairment or who are just looking um, for a nice pleasant walk. Um, and, you know, I, I think finally, just a, a final point is that 
you know, kind of lifelong, many people who have disabilities get the message that the outdoors may not be for them. Um, and that can make planning and outing, you know, quite challenging, you know, to, to make the leap. If, if for your life, you've gotten the message that, you know, maybe taking a hike, um, you know, being out in the woods isn't, isn't the place that you belong, but, you know, there's sidewalks or, or other kind of more uh, front country experiences available to you. It's a big leap to start thinking about planning a hike. And so, you know, to have a trail that's designated universally accessible, um, you know, that, that's out there will help to break down that barrier and, and help for people um, to imagine themselves out participating in recreation and experiencing all of the health benefits of it. So thank you for considering this proposal tonight. And I, I just want to make sure you have registered my very strong support. Thank you, Karen. All right, uh, George. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is George Kohad. I live at 234 State Street in Northampton. <clears throat> I want to uh, echo an earlier speaker, Lisa Klein, and uh, thanking all the board members for um, dedicating all this time, these long nights to these CPC proposals and applications. Um, your reward is going to come someday. Hang in there. Um, I'm coming today as a, a board member of the Friends of the Northampton Trails, um, which is in total full support of this application by the Office of Planning and Sustainability. I really can't say much more than Karen and Meg did. They did a wonderful job of really um, wrapping around the benefits of an accessible trail. Um, we at Friends of Northampton Trails know that our trail network of paved paths and hiking trails in the city is the envy of many communities. Um, but where we do fall short is having any trails of an accessible nature that really bring folks out into nature um, beyond the paved paths. Um, I think as Karen mentioned earlier, the Silvio Conti trail is a wonderful thing. It's kind of the Cadillac of accessible trails. I don't think the Office of Planning and Sustainability envisions that. Um, but it is something we desperately need. The, the mission of FNT is to really try to expand access to the trail systems, both paved and unpaved, um, and promote, as, as was said before, you know, more equity to the trails um, and a real sense of uh, um, yeah, accessibility for able people and those of limited mobility. Um, so this application is just meet all of that criteria. And uh, along with the one about access to the water, I think the, both of these are, are quite a combination. Um, but that being said, I, again, I think Meg and Karen spoke to all the other uh, benefits of this application in a really great way. And I just wanna add my full support um, for this application and I hope that you can find uh, the means to fund it um, totally. Thank you. Thank you, George. Other folks on the accessible trail, Rocky Hill Trail? Uh, Nick, is that your hand up? No, okay. Sarah, anybody else that you can say? No, I see no virtual hands. No virtual hands. Okay, uh, we're gonna move along to project number five, I believe which is the mortgage subsidy program uh, brought to us by the Valley CDC. People interested in speaking to that? Sarah, do you see anyone? I do not. Okay. Going once, going twice. No one for the mortgage subsidy program. All right, moving right along to Historic Northampton's proposal for the Shepherd Barn Preservation and Restoration Project. Uh, committee members and others may know that there were seven letters of support that were submitted. And we can look at those at the uh, Office of Sustainability website. Uh, I thought it was interesting. One of those letters was actually from a distant relative of the Shepherds. And I believe it's a him, his first name is Shepherd. So that was sort of interesting to read that. 
uh, folks out there who would like to speak to the Shepherd Barn Restoration Project? Uh, Stephanie? Hi, thank you. My name is Stephanie Billings, and I'm a resident of Leeds, and I'd just like to speak in support of the Shepherd's Barn Restoration. Um, my family has enjoyed Historic Northampton's activities for many years, um, and my daughter here um, spends time on the grounds weekly with the Western Mass Fiddle Orchestra, which is a multi-generational orchestra of various instruments, including fiddles. And I've gotten to see the space um, that will be restored and it's just um, a great gem for downtown Northampton and the community. It'll provide more ADA accessible space. Um, it is, if you've spent any time down in that area, it's a very welcoming space. You see um, people coming through all the time and uh, uh, Northampton, uh, historic Northampton uh, goes out of their way to make people and community members just uh, walking through feel welcome. And I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity for um, more programming, more concerts, um, and just uh, a, a great gem for downtown Northampton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie and daughter. All right, uh, George, once again. Hi everyone, I'm double dipping here, George Kohout, 234 State Street. Um, I, I'm here to support also the application by Historic Northampton. I had the real pleasure of working with uh, the staff and the volunteers and Sharon Merriman when the Shepherd Barn was emptied of all of the artifacts were, which were tossed mumbly jumbly over the years and were cataloged and and then put into temporary storage. Um, boy, were my eyes opened up by what a treasure trove was there. And I think this application speaks to um, the ability and the need to really um, spend a little bit extra on preserving these with expert hands and expert um, look and feel um, so that they can be uh, restored and presented to the public in a way that we didn't imagine 10, 15 years ago. Um, these artifacts really tell a story about Northampton and what a variety of occupations and lifestyles and people were in the city um, from the 16, the late 1600s on. I know the CPC has been great supporters of historic Northampton, and this is one of a couple of phases of the Shepherd Barn Restoration Project, um, but it's a really crucial one, and I think uh, the two directors have gone out of their way to spend a, a good amount of time um, researching, screening, interviewing uh, experts, conservators who will really take their time in helping the folks um, deal with some of the more important artifacts here. And a really nice piece of this that I like too is some of the staff at Historic Northampton might also get some training and some of the conservation um, conservatory techniques and tips, which really will help to build the capacity of Historic Northampton for future endeavors like this. Um, so thanks for letting me speak uh, in favor, and I hope that you could find your way to fully support the approximately $30,000 for this project. Thank you. Thank you, George. All right, um, Devin? Hi there, let me make sure. Yes, I'm unmuted. Um, I submitted a letter of support, so I will be brief, but don't take that to mean that I don't care a lot about this project. I could go on and on and tell you why I think this needs funding. Um, first and foremost, Historic Northampton has proven to be a very responsible uh, steward of CPC funds. Um, I supported a CPC project to stabilize Shepherd Barn when I was a member of your committee some years ago, and I've since like George, been a volunteer that has helped clean out some of the uh, findings that we, we ran into inside the barn. Um, from my work with CPC, I know that you prefer succinct and well-defined projects and that are accompanied with uh, estimates and possibly matching funds. And my experiences over the years, Historic Northampton has done just that. Um, 
George used the word phased, um, and I don't see that this way at all. This is a really succinct project of something quite different than the barn itself. These are the artifacts and hundreds of years old, some of them. So I see artifact restoration as an as a uh, of important historical items found in the barn. Uh, and I want professional involvement uh, to take care of those. And like George, I think there's a win-win a in learning the methods that will be used for that. So um, I encourage you to uh, support the project. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Rebecca? Hi. Um, I am the manager of the Fiddle Orchestra of Western Massachusetts, and we were headquartered at the uh, Northampton Senior Center for three years before COVID hit. And we were welcomed uh, to play outdoors at historic Northampton for the last two spring, summer, and falls. And it has made such a difference in our lives, and I think the lives of um, the people in the downtown area near historic Northampton who would hear us playing twice a week there. And some would come and picnic and, um, and dance <laughs> with their children. And it was, it created this um, really timeless feeling. And, you know, sitting under those trees and playing traditional tunes, it, it, brought to me this feeling that we need to feel connected to our past. We need to know that history is a, a continuous line and we often forget that. And, you know, having this performance space in the barn um, will be so enhanced by having these artifacts properly displayed and part of the the ambiance there. It, um, you know, again, a performance space at, at the senior center doesn't connect us in the same way as a performance space in a space that has relics of our past that remind us of where we've been and how, how things change and remain the same. And through music and through these objects, and through careful renovation of this space, um, I really believe that the feelings and the atmosphere will again be such a, a positive influence in our community downtown. And um, I, I hope that um, historic Northampton can, can make sure that these artifacts are properly cared for and restored and displayed. So thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, and Gina is next. Hello, I hope you can all hear me because I'm using strange setup here at my house. Um, I did write a letter in support of Historic Northampton's application uh, about the artifacts. And uh, I was about, I was going to speak to you tonight on different things uh, than I put in my letter, but I'm glad I followed um, Becky Shannon because uh, she said exactly what I was going to say. So I will tell you that um, I, I am also a person who has been on the grounds to play uh, fiddle and uh, how important it was to have that community and that space. Um, available for us and uh, having those artifacts in the barn um, is going to be a, a double great thing because it will connect us uh, to our history and I am repeating what she just said uh, very well. Um, but I wanted to go on the record that that's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gina. Other folks for Historic Northampton? I see no more hands. No more hands. Okay, uh, we have two projects left. Um, and we're moving on now to the outdoor pickleball feasibility study. 
brought to us by uh, Parks and Recreation Department, the City Parks and Rec Department. Anybody for this one? This one, by the way, received um, one written letter of support that, that came in to us already. There have been additional this afternoon that I oh, there haven't were. been able to put on the website yet, but we'll do that. Thank you, Sarah. Anybody for pickleball? Uh, Joan? Uh, Joan, you need to unmute. Uh, one more time. Uh, you have now disappeared, Joan, if you can hear us. Oh, there you are. So, Joan, that lower left button generally can get you into unmuting. Clicking on the lower left. Hello. Hello. Uh, let's see. There we, there go. we go. Got it. There we go. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much for your help. Um, as you can tell, I'm getting challenged as I get older, uh, which is why we play pickleball. Uh, we play three, four times a week, and it keeps us outside and active. And we have a group of about um, 35. Yeah, I think it's about 35 people. And we get together three to four times a week. And, Hello. And it keeps us healthy. <laughs> now, one of the things that for the need for the uh, courts to be public is that we play at Look Park. That's not really accessible for people who are low income. Um, I have a friend who actually parks her car at JFK and walks down to play and then walks back. She's 83 years old. So she must um, be enjoying the game. It's great fun. The, the 35 people, I'm Rufus and I'm piggybacking on Jones. Yeah, we live at 96 Coles Manor Road. But we, um, uh, we have a real community there, real accepting community. People drop in and stay. And, and they find that it's fun. It's, you know, there's a lot of laughter, a lot of caring, a lot of uh, teaching going on between, between us. Um, and uh, all of this is uh, on the basis of volunteers organizing and, and keeping it going by, by hook or by crook. Is that so, okay? Thank you. All right, and Phyllis is next. Uh, hi, I'm Phyllis Epstein and I live in Northampton. And I wanted to um, echo what uh, Joan and Rufus said um, one, one of the things about Pickleball that has really been wonderful was that during COVID, it was really a sport where you could be both socially distanced because you were six feet apart and also be outdoors and be social. And, um, yeah, and so through COVID, it was, it was such um, an important thing. It, it, it also attracts, um, it's, a, it's the fastest growing sport in the United States and it really attracts a lot of senior citizens. And, um, and it's, it, it's great exercise as, as well as um, being very social. And, and one of the things about it that I have found so um, great is also that um, you, you really meet people who you might not have met in other places. And so it really uh, brings a lot of different social networks together um, and, and really builds a, a sense of community. So um, I just would like to support um, increasing um, the recreational, out, um, recreational facilities in uh, Northampton. Thank you. 
Thank you, Phyllis. Other folks for the uh, outdoor pickleball feasibility study? Uh, I see a hand being raised, Kathy. Hi, thank you. I can't find the hand. Um, I wanna echo both what Joan and Rufus and Phyllis have been saying. Uh, this is my first year at Pickleball and it is truly a community of amazingly welcoming people of all ages. And I know for myself as a senior, being able to have a sport that I can age with is hugely important, um, both the, just being able to, you know, we've said it in other, all of these other proposals, how being outdoors is important, the accessibility is, is vital, and just the benefits of having a community of other people who you might not have known in any other way, but have come together to do this wonderful sport that provides, you know, community and health and, access to another world. So I just want to echo what everyone else has said and hope that you will support this process of getting us pickleball courts. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else in support or otherwise of pickleball? Uh, David and Doris. How do you do this? Uh, me. Uh. There you go. <laughs> I'm David Cohen. I live on Marion Street in Northampton. Uh, and I was really, this is my first uh, meeting of this type uh, in Northampton. And I was really struck by the um, community aspect of these proposals, uh, the garden proposal and all the other proposals about bringing people together of all ages, people that you wouldn't meet in any other way. Pickleball does that uh, really well. And I guess I wanted to point out one other thing. There's no real space, no public space for us to play pickleball uh, in Northampton. There is Look Park, which is terrific. They've been very helpful, very cooperative. But um, as someone pointed out, it is, um, it, is, it is on the expensive side for some. Uh, and to have a public space that supports this community uh, effort, this community activity would be terrific. All right, and uh, Cheryl is next. Sorry, I can't figure out chat. Can you hear me? Yes. Is that a yes? Yes, yes. it is. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I just want to say that also I want to echo what everyone else says and uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a technical issue. There we go. And I'd like to um, say that also, I think it's good uh, for the community, but it's also good in terms of tourism because pickleball is the largest growing sport. And when, like when I travel now, there's websites and this and that that say where there are courts and where there are, uh, you know, pickup games available. And I just think uh, it is a welcoming community. And I think it, there's a, a, a benefit in terms of uh, people coming to Northampton to, uh, to enjoy all we have to offer and pickleball could certainly be part of that. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Anyone else for the pickleball proposal? I do not see any hands. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the last Housing the Disabled Homeless Project, is there anyone out there who missed an opportunity to speak to any of the other eight proposals who would like to speak now? You can raise your hand or... Sarah, do we see anybody? Do not. Okay. Uh, last but certainly not least is the Housing and Disabled Homeless Project brought to us by Independent Housing Solutions. All right. Um, Timothy? 
Hi, I'm actually, I got two screens going. I'm so sorry. I think I might be labeled as Carissa where I'm speaking. Um, I have it on the phone as well, because as soon as I'm done, I'm going to, there's another gentleman who wants to speak, but he's limited in mobility. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so my name is Tim McCarthy. I am the director of um, case management. Am I creating issues with the, the double thing? Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Okay, I'm so sorry. Give me two seconds. I'll be making this, this better for everyone. everyone. Okay. okay. Now we have a single. Okay, we're single now. I'm so sorry for that. I've been running around. Anyways, I'm calling for, uh, or speaking from um, Craig's Doors. We are a shelter out of Amherst, and we work um, with a lot of folks from the Northampton area as well. Um, I cannot speak to how incredibly necessary additional housing of this type is. Um, it's it's very literally uh, a matter of life and death for some folks. Um, the housing shortage is so incredibly overwhelming. The homeless situation has ballooned as a result of COVID um, and trying to find affordable and supportive housing uh, is it's virtually impossible. That's what I spend all of my days doing. And, and while we do have some successes and the the Northampton Housing Authority is incredible. Finding spaces for people who have uh, extra needs, I guess, um, it just really can't be understated. So um, in the work that we do every single day, I meet people who would benefit from this project. Um, it's, uh, I think that the organization behind it um, has an incredible uh, reputation uh, in terms of impact for this particular demographic in this community. Um, and again, you know, tonight is the night that we opened our cot shelter and the response was overwhelming. Um, it, we just, it's such an incredible need. Um, and there's a gentleman actually who also wanted to, to speak. Um, if you can just give me one moment, I'm gonna run over to his room. Um, this is uh, Bob Savard, bear with me two seconds. Couldn't make it into the office, but Bob, are you uh, okay to share a few words? Okay, this is uh, Robert Savard. Hi. Uh, so you're kind of speaking to the whole group, sorry. Right. Hi, uh, yeah. Uh, I think Dr. Bossy is doing a good thing for us. Uh, I'm a quad amputee, and I've been homeless for a while, and uh, I really need a home, and there's a, a lot of other people just like me that would like to have a home, uh, a place to call home. And I think all in all, it would be a good thing for the community, a good experience for them. And it just would really help out a lot of people that really do need help. She, I think she's doing a really good thing by, by uh, establish, trying to establish this house for us. How long have you been homeless? I've been homeless for seven months. And uh, it's not fun out there when you don't have legs and hands. And there's a lot of people like me. I believe that Dr. Boss is doing this to better us and for the community. Where were you know? before you came here? No, I was um, on the street in Northampton. And uh, somebody, Dr. Boss, he got me to integrate Craig the door to get me off the street. It was getting cold. Why were you on the street? Um, I left the nursing home because it's horrible conditions in there. Uh, I could only get a shower once a week. Uh, Asked to go to the bathroom was a big ordeal. Um, here I can have my own private care person and people are taken care of. Um, that I would like the opportunity to show you that I'm right. And Dr. Bossi is right also that we are good people. We just need a little bit of help. And she's willing to help us. And that's, a, that, that's rare nowadays. So I would appreciate it. You would consider her uh, application this evening. Okay, thank you very much for your time. We did have, a, I had a couple of other folks um, who did want to speak and unfortunately they uh, 
grew a bit tired and, and had to tap out. But there are another I'm still here. Uh, 25 people in this building that would echo those sentiments that there just there needs to be access to this sort of housing. Um, and, and this feels like a, a real opportunity to do real good um, for people within that space. So I will uh, wrap up there. Hi, hey. can you hear me? Thank, thank you, both of you, for, for your comments. Can you hear me? Uh, I, I, yeah. The, the 306 number, I was muting you only because we were getting some feedback and it was hard to hear the other people speaking. But if oh, you I'm wanted sorry. to talk, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I didn't no know problem. what to do. I kept unmuting myself because <laughs> I was like, why it keep muting me? <laughs> Hi, my name is Rosalind Drummer and I'm a counselor, a residential counselor for the Interfaith Cot Shelter. And I've been working with um, the homeless for like six and a half years. And I have one um, candidate here that is a patient of Dr. Bossy's, and I also can attest um, what she's trying to do would be very helpful um, for the community because um, Ray is homeless and he's disabled and he needs somewhere to stay also. And I was talking to a group of people up in Northampton um, maybe about two days ago. And a lot of people are worried about where they're going to be living, you know, in the winter seasons and not just the winter seasons, but just living on the streets. Um, it's hard for them. Um, and then with their health conditions and stuff, um, with all that Dr. Bossy is trying to do, it really would be beneficial for the community. Thank you so much for your comment. You're welcome. I need to look at myself. Do you have anything I should? Okay. All right, and Kate. Uh, Sarah, who are we going with? Uh, Kate Cardoso. Kate. I'm sorry. I think Kate? you said Kate. Kate. Yes. Kate. Hi, I'm I'm Kate Cardoso. I am a Florence resident. I'm also president of the MANA board. And so I have a statement on behalf of MANA Community Kitchen. We have, um, we are big supporters of Dr. Bossy and we are big supporters of this, this project. So I'd like to tell you why this project is important to us at MANA. While our primary focus at MANA is serving those in the community who face hunger and food insecurity with hot, nutritious and delicious meals, a secondary and equally important mission of ours is to improve the lives of those experiencing housing, financial and or food insecurity by offering tools and resources that nourish, aid, educate and support guests in achieving more stability, security and self-sufficiency. This project is all of those things. The residents of this project, the future residents of this project are often unable to consistently access our meals because of their itinerant sheltering circumstances and physical limitations. Through this project, we will be able to provide them with nourishment on a regular basis in addition to all of the other services and care they'll be receiving that will help them lead healthier and more stable lives. Uh, when we first met as a community group uh, a couple of months ago, I think it was, um, I, I said this and it keeps coming back to me, um, if not here, where, if not now, when, if not this, what? Uh, I think this is a really critical project for our community and for those who are unhoused in our community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And uh, Terrell is next. Uh, Sarah, you want to call on that person again? Hello? There he is. You guys hear me? Yeah, yes, we can. go ahead. How's it going? Good, thank you. All right. So I'm here. <laughs> what's, what's going on? Uh, do you have comments to make on this disabled homeless housing project? Uh I think it's great to have, you know, people need help, you know, support, you know, love and care, man, nurturing and everybody. People out there, that's, you know, especially the homeless community is getting grown bigger and bigger, you know. So I think. Tyrell, uh, Tyrell, it's Dr. Bossy. Yes. Are you, are you homeless? Huh? Are you homeless? Pretty much. Chronically, I've been homeless for a long time. You know that. How, yeah, I know, but you're here to try to explain the circumstance that we are facing. How long have you been homeless, Tyrell? 
I've been homeless about 20 years almost, I guess. I know. Where are you living right now? I am in Holyoke at the Motel 6. Yeah. And CHD is putting you up. They yes. get an enormous amount of funding for that. Mm -hmm. Are you thriving where you are? Am I thriving? Am I, I'm trying my best. I know. Are you happy where you are? I'm happy to be off the streets. You know, it's a blessing. You know, Which, and I'm happy. But, uh, you know, I, I think I need more care, you know. How you often know. do you go to the hospital, Tyrell? All the time. And it's really critical and tiring because I'm dealing with my health problems. I got a lot of medical problems. Yeah. And How many times a week do you think you go to the hospital? Four or five times a week. Right. Do you think you could go to the hospital less if you had the right kind of housing and the right kind of support? I absolutely think I would. The right type of care, you know, support and um, physical care and support and love and, and you know, on the, all that, you know, and I, I think, you know, because I'm not getting that help, it's hard for me to do things on my own, you know. Yep. Tyrell, can you get a personal care attendant at the shelter? No. No. We've tried that for years. Yeah, what happened to you? Remember when we finally got you that really important wheelchair? What yeah, happened got, What happened to it? I got stolen in Holyoke, and I was really disappointed with that because I needed that chair. You know? I know. And, and now what do you and now what do you nothing. yep how what do you do now when you fall down i think ammo's gotta come get me up yep yep all right do you want to tell do you want to tell the the community of northampton anything else about what you need this is your this is your moment my friend i just want myself i need help with everything i, I just want the pro help you know with my physical help my, and my mental health as well. I need help with, um, you know, a lot of things that I, in life, you know, physical stuff I need, medical stuff I need. I need, um, with the weight is the main thing. I need help with, um, you know, um, a lot of stuff I can't do physically because I'm so overweight. I'm over almost 700 pounds almost, you know? Right. I can't really walk, you know, I can't really shower, different things. Tyrell. A lot of stuff. Do you think you could make progress on those things if you had a, a medically supported place to live? I definitely think so. Something that's stable, that's on the long term, and put people there to help me and nurture me and do things for me that I can't do and try to teach me to do things too, also to help me, guide me. Absolutely. And support, a lot of support, and I need that really bad. So you want to get better? That's what I hear. Of course I do. I want to heal. Awesome. I definitely do. All right. Thank you, Tyrell. You're welcome. Thank you, Tyrell. You're welcome. Okay to go or do you need me to stay? You're welcome to stay. Uh, we'll move on to other people's comments. Thank you. All right. You guys have a nice night. Same to you. Hi, uh, my name is Ace Taylor, they, them. I live in Northampton, Ward 3. Uh, I found out about this project due to my work on the housing partnership. Uh, while we were unable to vote on this, uh, there were many members of the partnership that expressed strong support. And I'm here tonight to also express my support for this project and my hope that uh, it gets funded. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Okay. Um, Rick Hart. Hi, uh, I'm Rick Hart. I live at 68 Leonard Street in Leeds, and I'm here to speak for the Friends of Hampshire County Homeless, which is one of the partners in, in this project. Um, this is actually the fourth project of housing for homeless people that I've spoken in front of this committee for, but it's the first one where we weren't the lead agency. Um, and I'd really like to speak most about that. I, I, I think a lot has been said about the urgency of, of this population. Um, each of our houses, we've tried to work on helping a population that was not fitting into the system as it was, which is why we did homeless youth. We did people suffering from substance abuse. Um, so when we heard about this thing, we just jumped at it because one of the hardest populations to really get into housing is people with um, physical disabilities, especially multiple ones. 
Um, so what I want to say about why we're particularly enthusiastic about this project besides that uh, is that it's the first one we've worked on. And I think this is the way of the future with getting this kind of stuff done where there have been a number of different agencies all pulling together to, to create the project. Um, and I have to say, for, first of all, for instance, the Friends of the Homeless could never do this if we were pulling all the weight. So it's a chance for us to do something about this population without having to try to push the whole rock up the mountain by ourselves. Um, it, uh, it also, uh, involves, which I, I want to speak on, a, a private partner, a, a, a private investor type partner, which I had understood some people were a little baffled by. But I wanted to say that that is actually a very well-known model for creating this kind of project. Um, it, it, the strengths of each group, of each entity, uh, contribute to the final result. Um, so. That's another exciting thing. It's really a multi-collaborative project. Um, I did send to Sarah a bit late in this process because I didn't realize this might have been an issue, uh, a link to just one of many online studies and, and articles about uh, private-public partnerships. And uh, I hope she'll share that with the commission and the committee members. Um, so yeah, we're, we're really excited about this. I think it's, it's, it's going to happen one way or the other, uh, but uh, getting the, the full CPC grant would be a big help. It would speed it up and there are people that are going to be out there this winter and next winter, probably if we have to take a long time on it. So um, I urge you please to support this as much as you can. I see, I can see you have a lot of good projects on the table uh, and thank you for your time and for uh, listening to all of us. Thank you, Rick. All right, um, Sarah Buttonweiser. Hi, I'm Sarah Buttonweiser. I live at 46 Franklin Street, so just down the street from this project. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing with the CPC. I actually had no idea about the breadth of the pro projects and um, as, as someone else said recently, how community is so inherent in each one of them. And part of why, to me, this project feels so important is that this is a group of people who do not have other resources to reach out to, to make community work, but a lot of hope to be able to do it. And I certainly hope that our neighborhood can be supportive of the project and, um, and improving the city because learning from Dr. Bossi about the weights that people have undergone and as Tyrell just said himself, 20 years homeless, um, that's an abomination. I don't wanna live in a city where somebody has to endure that. Um, I, it, 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 I, it has really, um, I've been carrying that for just a month or so and I feel like I could crawl out of my skin to know it. So the sooner we can make this happen, I think the better. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And Stephanie. Hi, thank you. I'm Stephanie. It's um, just what or me have said about this project. I'm a primary doctor at the Holyoke Health Center. I've been there for 15 years. And my background training is in medical care for people experiencing homelessness. There is such a need for this project. I can't tell you um, uh, how important this would be, um, how much we see on a day-to-day -day basis. It is near impossible for folks to be able to, um, to something as simple as wound care or to be able to have a safe place to use their insulin. Um, and have a, a, a it's, it's very hard to do when you don't have a stable place to stay. So I just like to um, voice my support for this project. I think that um, Mr. Samard and Tyrell's um, stories um, uh, were very powerful and that there's just hundreds of folks in our own community who um, are in similar 
situation in the greater um, Western Mass area. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, Karen Foster. Hi again, um, Karen Foster. I'm the Ward 2 City Councilor, similar to George earlier. I'm also double dipping um, on projects. Um, Ward 2 includes Franklin Street, where this project is proposed. So I wanted to make sure the committee knew um, that this project has the support of the Ward Councilor. Um, you know, we, we have, I have helped Dr. Bossi um, do some of the outreach to the neighborhood and with the Butters. Um, you know, and, and there is support in the neighborhood um, for this project, um, for this being on Franklin Street. Um, it's as we've heard and, and, and um, heard so powerfully, um, this project is desperately needed. And um, like to echo Sarah Buttonweiser's words that I want to live in a city where we are housing people who need it um, and people that we heard speak tonight. As the ward counselor um, where this project is proposed, it will have my support um, as it goes through the process. And I just wanted to very briefly touch on one comment I saw in the proposal um, that the cost per unit of this proposal is higher than other um, proposed single room occupancy housing. And, and I just wanted to speak to that briefly um, because as I think we've heard, the needs that this project is addressing are greater and more complicated and therefore going to be more expensive um, than other housing. Um, and so, you know, there, there's, I've seen the plans, um, you know, there's, there's rooms for bariatric support, um, wider rooms um, for people who are going to need more space or larger bathrooms. Um, all of that, all of that just costs money um, to serve people in the way that they need to. And, um, you know, I, I applaud, um, this project and this proposal and for all of the thoughtful and critical ways that it proposes um, to house people and to serve them well um, and to help them improve and to do better. And just very briefly, I met with um, Jim Nash earlier today. He's the Ward 3 City Councilor. Um, he couldn't be here tonight, um, but he wanted me to also express his support. Um, as many people will know, the Sergeant House is in his ward. Uh, and he wanted me to express his support for this project as well. Thanks again for all of the good work you're doing. Thank you, Karen. Okay, uh, Hannah Schaefer. Hi there. Uh, my name is Hannah Schaefer. I am a member of the Northampton Housing Partnership. I wanted to speak in support um, of the Independent Housing Solutions Project tonight. Um, in 2014, I lost a friend to chronic homelessness, um, and it's the kind of thing that I feel like could have been prevented had a system like this been in place. Um, homelessness is complex. It often comes with uh, people experiencing disability, um, mental health concerns, addiction. Um, it's multi multifaceted and a space like this that can allow people to both have the immediate need of housing and a roof over their heads being met and that level of stability and also food and medical care. Um, I don't know what my friend Mubu's story could have looked like had he had a space like this, but I believe that this space will absolutely save lives. So uh, I'm speaking in unequivocal support and um, I hope this happens. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Jeff Harnes. Hello, everyone. And um, thank you to the committee for uh, listening tonight and all of your work. Jeff Harness, and I'm a resident of Northampton on Lyman Road. But um, speaking tonight in my capacity representing Cooley Dickinson Healthcare. And um, I want to offer a couple of numbers for a couple of patients that I think are very compelling. Uh, thanks to Dr. Bossi's intervention, there are a couple of residents who, um, who found housing, rental housing in Florence for some period of time. And I wanna give a little before and after for, for two of these folks. As you can imagine, um, our emergency department is, 
amazingly busy, certainly right now uh, with COVID and the aftermath. And um, an emergency department is really not the right place for someone who's homeless with a disability unless they really have a medical reason for being there. But we find that a lot of people come in more for social reasons. In other words, they don't have access to those building blocks of life, like housing, transportation, that a lot of us take for granted. So patient number one was visiting our emergency department a lot, 19 times in one year, 37 times the next year, and then was able to uh, find rental housing. And uh, the ER visits went down to two the next year, and then zero. Uh, last year. Uh, think about that from 37 down to zero. It's pretty amazing. Patient number two is even more dramatic. Uh, in 2018, visited us 73 times. The next year, 70 times. And then uh, was placed in rental housing. And the ER visits went down to two. In the last year, it was nine. So um, clearly programs like this can work. And housing is really critical for, uh, for folks with such compromised uh, medical and, and social situations. So um, thank you for considering those compelling numbers. And I'll turn it over to the next person. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Jay? Hello there. It's Jay Levy from Elliott CHS Homeless Services. Can you hear me? Yep, okay, great. Um, so we do outreach in the Northampton area. We work with people who are uh, living on the streets, people who are in the woods and the parks. Um, and I think one of the important aspects of this project is it's really gonna improve the quality of life, not only for the people who are homeless, but also for the people that live in the town and the city of, of Northampton. I mean, it's really about, you know, the answer to homelessness is affordable housing and affordable housing plus support services. And the real um, uh, success stories that we've seen nationally on this has been through the housing first movement. And um, this really is a housing first type project. In other words, it brings affordability, a place with uh, support services. We're building the services around the people that are getting housed. And Elliot's involved in the sense that we're actually locating some of the people and making the referrals and currently working with Dr. Bossy and others uh, who are seeing these clients. And, um, and we can help in kind of the warm handoff of connecting people directly to the housing, uh, supporting people to transition well into the housing, uh, which is so important. And in addition, we get kind of a value added, which I think is very important is uh, we have a housing stabilization program uh, that we can offer called CSPEC services. We're able to bill Medicaid uh, and through that provide the support services that would be needed extra support for people who are living uh, at this particular residence. So what's great is we do have a village of uh, providers, of people who are very uh, dedicated to the folks in need, people, uh, you know, that spoke here, Tyrell and others, um, and folks that uh, we can continue then to see even after they're placed um, in the housing. And I think what you're going to find uh, is that it's going to reduce medical costs, as it was said, it'll literally save lives. And I think it'll make a difference in the quality of life uh, for the people in the town of Northampton. So I strongly support this project. Uh, the answer to homelessness is housing, is support service, and this is a prototype type model. And I, I really applaud Dr. Bossy and others on the board uh, for getting this uh, together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Katie? Hi, my name is Katie Mirnicki. I have worked with the homeless population probably since 2007. Um, I've managed the homeless shelters in Northampton for about eight years, and I started working with Dr. Bossy about four, maybe five years ago. 
Um, and I do have to say, you know, once we house someone, uh, we at the beginning, we always thought was okay, our job was done. We've have housed someone, let's move on to the next person. And that obviously didn't work. Um, so when Bossy came on board, she started visiting our SROs, um, the Florence Inn and other SROs that I managed when I worked at ServiceNet. And it was it was amazing that how people's lives was so improved immediately. And this was once or maybe twice a week that Dr. Bossi visited someone. Her project, this project is, there's, there's a doctor's office in the building. I mean, there's someone going to be there daily. Um, and this is really important. Um, and I just wanna go back to Jeff Harness, what he said, I remember working at the shelters back in 2007 and when i had to turn someone away they would look at me and say it's okay i'll just go to an emergency room and hang out there all night um so the, people do that people still do it um so i fully support this project i think it's great thank you thank you katie when Um, yes, hello. My name is Gwenever Lodi Nabad, and I live in Northampton, and I live in public housing. And um, I wanted to speak to this because I feel like it also ties in in so many ways with things that MANA do or Grow Food Northampton does. But I do want to share a little bit about my own personal experience. Um, I arrived in Northampton in 2019 after I had been homeless for two years, and I am a semi-neurodivergent adult, um, and I have a daughter who also has issues and a son who has cognitive challenges. And, um, you know, it's been really challenging during the transitional part of this and also trying to get um, even public housing to understand um, some of the challenges of, um, disabilities, but I also want to share that during my homelessness, I had to let go of all of my supportive services. My daughter and I had to let go of all our supportive services, and it was really um, a terrible experience. And I slept in my car, which I was very lucky to have a car. Um, you know, I, you know, spent a lot of time out in the woods. Um, I had also, the homelessness was caused by having been rear-ended. So, you know, so that was, that was, you know, after my car was fixed, I, I left where I was living because I didn't want to screw this woman over, never thinking that we could actually become homeless or that somebody might not rent me an apartment. And, um, you know, it really caused a lot of um, turmoil for me, my mental health, my daughter, her mental health. It split us up at times. It, it caused us both to be more vulnerable because we were separated. And, um, and I have to say that when I came here, I just can't even begin to say how amazing my involvement with so many of you that are speaking tonight for this, including Community Preservation Committee, um, you know, it was one of my first experiences to come and in, in front of the, the CPC and speak about, you know, important matters that are were occurring here at, at where I live. And, um, and so I want to thank everyone who sits here for long hours, <laughs> all very long hours, and we we're all listening and I know that I am and um, and so as someone in Tyrell, I've met Tyrell, like, I don't, I don't even feel like downtown Northampton would be the same without Terrell. I've seen him so many times. And, um, and we love our homeless people. And I want to live in a city like that. I want to, I just wanna say where I've come since my daughter and I are housed. So now that my daughter and I are housed, I am going to Holyoke Community College um, I have been involved with many, many legislative um, things that I care about, including climate action now. Um, I'm, I'm going to HCC, I'm on high honors, and I'm hopefully transferring to Smith. And so it really makes it worth it um, to see, even if you don't see the light in somebody in their homelessness, it just can really happen so quickly that 
they can blossom. And that's exactly what's happening with me and my daughter by having a home. It's just that the supportive services are so essential and they do cost a little bit of money and there is a way to make it work. And if there is a way to make it work, and I just want to say thank you to everyone that is here tonight for all your different reasons. You know, they're all just, it's overwhelming really. But I, I just, I wasn't going to speak and then I was going to speak, but I speak for that. So, and, and just the inclusion is just so important. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Gwen. Andrea? Hi, uh, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. My video is, something's wrong with it and it won't turn on. So um, I wanted to speak because I live at 65 Franklin Street and I will be a neighbor to these folks who will be moving in at the end of my street, hopefully in the relatively near future. Um, I uh, am inspired by the way all these different agencies are working together to make this happen. And um, it warms my heart and my soul to know that I think the number was 16 people we will, will be um, housed with all the support services that they need and no longer on the streets of Northampton. Oh my. Um, and I'm just really proud and pleased to be uh, in this neighborhood where this is gonna happen. And, um, and I'm, I'm also proud, proud of our city for, for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And Timothy? Hey, I'm sorry. I think uh, I'm I'm left over from the beginning of the conversation, but having okay. down a bit, I, I wanted to speak uh, just very briefly. Um, I'm also a, a student of mental health sciences and um, in a master's program, and I just wanted to speak also of the the relative innovation of the project in terms of having services directly on site um, could really create a model uh, of success for. Um, other regions that are not necessarily providing that immediate need of service. Those, we talk sometimes about material human rights and it's a, a true near impossibility to be able to, to become mentally healthy, to, to exercise mental hygiene when you are so fixated on survival. Um, and services like this can truly provide people with the infrastructure that they need to to live in a sustained housing model and framework and um i just wanted to emphasize that point as well on my own behalf thank you thank you tim and brian i see no more hands up no more hands have people people spoken for the housing the disabled homeless project is anyone out there feel left out and wanting to speak to this project or any other project. Uh, as always, in listening to the public comment, I'm struck by uh, how caring and supportive and articulate our neighbors are and how we all are uh, in it together to try to do the right thing for, for, our, for our town. Uh, once again, I encourage everyone to uh, attend our November 17th meeting. That's two weeks from now at seven o'clock. I think I can speak for the committee by saying we're not going to begin deliberations tonight, but uh, we will do that on the 17th. And the goal is to get through all nine of these projects on the 17th so we can send them off to city council who will vote as the city council that they currently is, not the one that's, ones that we elected um uh, yesterday uh so thank you all for uh folks that are still out there for your comments and uh and and your participation uh committee members is there any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published 
Uh, Brian, I just wanted to check with the committee to see if there's anything that I should prepare or things that would assist in decision making. I am planning on putting together draft council orders that I'll get to you next week. But if there's anything else, then let me know and I'm happy to do that. Yes, Sarah, there is. Okay. Um, if you could resend, because I haven't been able to find a document you sent out um, three meetings ago regarding some of the uh, state guidelines for um, uh, our 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 participation in um, private entities. Do you know Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I do. Yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. And Sarah, I think you also were going to tell us uh, what you see on the horizon. What who who you've heard from that uh, might be interested in submitting proposals for the next funding round. Yes, that would and be I, helpful I'll, as well. Thanks. I'll, I'll get that to you before the next meeting. As we deliberate uh, projects, we're also going to be looking at conditions uh, on uh, for those projects. So, Sarah, if you could also perhaps do some of the wording on those, some of the conditions that we talked about um, regarding the uh, um, the disabled homeless project, the uh, um, facade repair at Michelson. And I think that might be at those two that we had talked about. I think that'd be helpful to have some written language outlining what some of those conditions will be. Uh, Julia? Yeah, um, so I, uh, after our last meeting, I spent quite a bit of time looking, obviously enough, at our guideline that we get from the, the actual act that, that creates us as a committee. Um, but I also took a look around at how some of the other towns and cities are managing their CPC process. And um, I just wanted to bring to the attention of the committee something that we might consider, not this round because it's too late, but in the future, uh, take a look at um, what Hingham has and I can send it to Sarah and she can pass it on to the other commission mem committee members uh, in their CPC process manual. One of the things that I really appreciated from Hingham, and I spent a lot of time reading through it, is that they actually have a decision guideline page. Now, I've served on other committees that do grants and that score grants. We obviously aren't scoring grants. We're not, you know, an NIH review committee or something. But I feel like it might help us moving forward to think about putting together guidelines for how we make decisions. Uh, I know we're looking at some very different types of issues with the projects from a project proposed by a private entity to projects where we would love to see things more fully developed potentially before they come into the grant, uh, grant moment. And, and still we have to make the decisions. And so um, we don't have it now, but it's something that I'd really like us to look at. And uh, Sarah, should I just send you this manual if you want to take a peek at it? Yeah, please do. Okay, um, and and um, uh, yeah, that's all I really wanted to say because I am hopeful that I'll be there on the 17th, uh, but there is a, a little glitch in my schedule. So thanks. Well, thank you, Julia, for your research on that. And Sarah, if you could get that out to the rest of us, that would be, that could be really helpful. And hopefully we'll see you on the 17th, Julia. Uh, any other committee members with requests from Sarah? Uh, I see Jessica, uh, Dr. Bossy, with your hand up. Is that, was your hand up? No, I just wanted to jump in and ask Sarah to let me know what the committee needs so that we can get that to you. Great. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of Sarah or comments? Um, looks like Dan has his hand up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Brian and Sarah. I, I'm just so grateful for all the speakers tonight. Uh, this was such an inspiring meeting. Uh, my, my question for Sarah for next meeting is uh, one, just from staff, city staff uh, perspective, do you view that all the projects meet eligibility for CPA funds? And two, just confirming we have more funds available to disperse than the total funds requested by the applicants. And I look forward to supporting these projects. Uh, perhaps there we can begin the 17th with yet one more just quick glance at the finances to make sure that we have full understanding of that. Thanks, Dan, for 
reminding us of that. Anything else? Uh, once again, thank you all. This is our third meeting in three weeks. And uh, I don't believe in my tenure we've ever had so many public comments before. I'm looking at, um, I think, over 30 or 35 of them, something like that. So, uh, and Zoom seemed to work for almost all of it with a few minor glitches there. So hurrah for that. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Linda. A second? Uh, Julia? And we will see you on the 17th of November. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.